Hi everyone, thank you so much for coming today. The intersection between the climate emergency and mental and physical health will become one of the world's major issues, according to Dr. Courtney Heward, who is a board president of the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment. It is a little bit ridiculous to um, abandon the realm of this totality of your work, which we have a pleasure to experience in the Dome, which is definitely, as Thomas Oberender says, the medium for art in the 21st century. And to come back to this uh, pre-quantic uh, neocortex mode of communication about art to, uh, to this um, logocentric domain, but maybe uh, we can we can learn more um, from explanations about the background, about your motivation. And as Adrian said, you uh, make the works around the corner. I really like this expression. So he said it's about permafrost, but actually it's pretty much about the mass extinction. Also, we are approaching um, more or less, pro most probably now. And how do you, why did you decide even to use this around the cornerness in this uh, situation of the obvious um, dynamics of extinction? In, to, in order to talk about what I just quoted uh, now, which refers to our immediate emergence, emergent situation, you referred to the permafrost era. Like, why did you send us back to that age before we experienced ourselves in the here and now of the very emergent moment. Uh, well, so just to give a small introduction about um, uh, about the event that uh, I'm referring to in my piece. Uh, uh, my piece is a kind of a hypnotic uh, seance where a hypnotic session where the viewer is uh, being taken uh, to, to the uh, Permian era, which uh, ended with the uh, the largest mass extinction in the history of uh, of the Earth, uh, which happened um, happened uh, uh, two hundred fifty million years ago. Uh, so this event called uh, the Permian Triassic extinction, uh, as um, as it is understood uh, more at the moment, uh, happened due to the uh, climate change and uh, due to the global warming. Uh, basically, what happened was that uh, apparently uh, the um, most possible e explanation is that uh, due to the uh, increased activity of the uh, volcanoes in the, uh, on, the on the territory of, uh, uh, of uh, Siberia, uh, contemporary si Siberia, because I mean, at that time uh, there was only one uh, continent uh, on Earth, uh, Pangaea. Uh, so, due to the um, increased volcanic activity, the uh, the coal that was um, already stored in the crust of the Earth uh, started to burn, and uh, and this created. Uh, positive feedback loop process that uh, resulted in um, in a release of the uh, big quantities of uh, methane and um, uh, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which uh, resulted in um, acidification of uh, seas. Um, and, um, and this resulted in, uh, in high, uh, very, very sharp uh, rises in the temperatures on, on Earth. This process took uh, thousands of years. It's, it's not, uh, uh, this change was not as fast as the change that we are exper experiencing uh, at the moment. Uh, but uh, Earth became uh, almost sterilized. So uh, basically uh, 20, uh, about 95% uh, of life uh, disappeared from from the surface of the earth above uh, the marine life and the uh, land life 
and um, yeah, so this is the the starting point of the piece, um, and uh, another reference that uh, that I'm uh, making in the piece is the uh, the happiest thought uh, of Al Al Albert Einstein, uh, and also just to give you a short explanation to the ha happiest thought, uh, the popular reading of uh, what is called the happiest thought of Albert Einstein is um, basically the description of a situation where, where uh, a workman is falling from the rooftop of the construction site and uh, uh, while he's falling uh, together with his toolbox uh, it is not possible to set one point of reference uh, to his fall. Uh, therefore, we are uh, we cannot be really sure if uh, if, if he is experiencing a free fall, or rather, uh, he is just uh, floating in a, uh, together with these tools in kind of a, a gravity-less state. Uh, and what I found interesting in this reference is. Uh, um, exactly the uh, this inability of uh, of setting a, a point of, of reference so the ar arbitrariness of uh, of uh, of this uh, situation another another uh, reading of the happiest thought is uh, is a situation where uh, someone is uh, uh, is sitting in a room without windows, which is which could be a room just like this one, um, where we cannot be sure if uh, we are um, in the gravitational field of a planet, or or rather if we are uh, on the board of the spacecraft, uh, which is uh, flying with a certain acceleration, and therefore we are just uh, pressed to the bottom of the spacecraft. So one could um, assume that by introducing this relativity or by shifting this point of reference or questioning the point of reference, we might see the climate change we're experiencing now as a climate chance. Well, I mean, it's uh, for sure it's a chance for the for the biosphere to come as something completely different. <laughs> and for us, also according to your technique, or for um, I don't even know methodology, one would maybe say, of shifting the perspective of um, the viewer, it would also somehow help him if he and her or her, she or it are assuming themselves as part of this biosphere to, to shift the perspective from, from this rather depressive uh, prospect of extinction towards something, some kind of, you know, relativity would treat the potential depression or... <laughs> Uh, I mean, it's uh, yeah for sure. This uh, this work is um, uh, basically the question that I set in the work is uh, is the, the question: um, What does the mass extinction really uh, mean in the world where everyone has to die? Uh, so this work is very philosophical and. Um, Mm, I feel that uh, what you are talking about, this uh, aspect of alienating the viewer, uh, is also very important. I, I think that uh, the multitude of voices that are um, inscribed in the work and uh, uh, the fact that uh, the nar narrator is um, somehow sometimes addressing the... Um, his uh, speech to, to the viewer uh, and sometimes representing the viewer is um, and in the end just representing this cutout phase that uh, 
somehow symbolizes just nothingness uh, is also very important in the uh, in the process of alienating the viewer. So I I, um, I would say that the viewer is the most important element of the of this installation. Um, also due to the um, to the, due, due to the technology of the of the dome itself, uh, how how the uh, this immersive uh, full dome projection uh, and immersive soundscape affects the very body of the viewer. It seems also that the viewer, in some way, dehumanized in uh, his um, mode of perception of the work because that is the moment when uh, the viewer cannot really feel their body that much. It is more or less an out-of-body experience just to see this work. And also, due to the shift of perspectives and alienation, it seems that the very core of human being is taken away from the human being. So it's, in a way, having the de-anthropocening de effect, and at the same time, you are searching for something very human in your work, I have a feeling, with my poor perception abilities. I might be wrong, but it feels like... I mean, this, this work is addressed to the humans, <laughs> that, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, and... Um, um, yeah, I. Mm, sorry, I lost my thoughts now. No, this is addressed to the humans, and they, it, it is also asking the humans for something. And this moment comes when. Um, actually, this moment of addressing the human comes, according to my opinion, um, when, when the human is singing towards the other towards addressing the, that force that then appears as the face of the cut out eyes and the mouth. This is the moment when the human sings to the very divine aspect of this. I don't know if it's very divine according to your opinion, but to my perception you are, um, this, this human is discussing something with something that humanity sees as God or something. That is the spiritual aspect of addressing yourself as a human. Yeah, I mean, for sure, there is a, there are moments in the piece where um, this sort of a higher instance is addressed by the narrator, uh, but because of this like constant shifts in the uh, in the narrator, in the voice of the narrator, uh, and multiplicity of the um, of the personalities that uh, the narrator um, has inside. Um, this um, this this narrator is at the same time addressing just uh, themselves and um, um, apart from the this higher instance and um, I think that uh, this relates to this particular moment that uh, that we are in, uh, and also what, what you mentioned in the, this quote that you that you just read, uh, the certain uh, state of uh, mind that uh, that we are in at the moment, uh, which relates to the loss of hope, and uh, and this piece is for me a lot about uh, the loss and the mourning and uh, and the processes of mourning. Um, I think that uh, the key aspect of this work, which is uh, poetry, which is also basically um, the tool that I'm using in, in, in general in my works, uh, is uh, one of the tools of dealing with this, uh, with this, uh, with this chaos. And, and, and I mean, now I'm actually re referencing the, the book of... Uh, uh, Franco before Berardi, where uh, the the breathing, uh, where he uh, presents uh, our uh, contempor contemporality as uh, being driven by um, suffocating processes uh, and uh, the chaos 
of respiration, which can be overcome by poetry, uh, where poetry serve, serves as a um, tool to, uh, to, pro to propose, again, as an order to, to the chaos that uh, surrounds us. By transferring uh, before to Latour, it would be poetry that helps to overcome solastalgia, although solastalgia is not Latour's term, but anyway, it would be overcoming the grief. It would be the method of dealing with grief in the Anthropocene. Poetry is a method of dealing with grief in the Anthropocene. How was it actually to work on it, technologically speaking? What was the big, enormous difference in uh, pictorial terms? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think that uh, this, uh, this tool of immersiveness, uh, especially as experiencing the planetariums, is, uh, is very powerful, uh, mostly due to the aspect of um, uh, affecting directly the, the body of the viewer uh, in many different ways. Uh, uh, the, the first ways uh, of uh, the first tool is uh, basically um, the aspect of um, the, the possibility of making the viewer losing their uh, sense of balance uh, quite easily, um, and I find it uh, really powerful and and also really in align with. Uh, the attempts that I had in my previous works to uh, to affect directly the body of the viewer uh, with the very um, physicality of the of the experience. Um, the <coughs> it was it was uh, difficult to to develop this piece. It was uh, it, it was difficult for me to to switch to this new format, uh, mostly due to the fact that. Um, what I realized was that uh, basically um, I, I learned for many years how to uh, arrange a, a frame and this frame is gone in this situation. So uh, this frame is just surrounding us. So uh, there is a, there must be like a very different way of, of, uh, of arranging this, uh, this space. So this I found uh, actually more difficult than the, uh, dealing with technological problems uh, and um, learning the new uh, technology. Uh, but also this is something that uh, gives you lots of possibilities. Um, and um, yeah, I, I think that um, it's very that that this space uh, gives you also a lot of tools to directly affect the emotions of the viewer through all of these uh, aspects that I, I really mentioned, uh, which is also something that was always very interesting to me. Um, so this tool of immersion which is usually used by industries and those industries are interested in controlling, manipulating our emotions and producing the effect. By using this tool, this very tool, you are taking the viewer into a different kind of immersions or immersion or is this immersion project is interpreting the term immersion is a very critical um, take of this term. They, I mean, sorry to uh, paraphrase your project, but <laughs> it's um, immersion is when you don't even notice that you are in the environment of the immersion and you only realize that you are, have been in the immersion when you are taken out of it. Like uh, if you would be a fish, who is swimming in the water and then somebody will take you out and then you will only notice that you were in the water. So using domes uh, as an artistic medium would take the viewer from the usual immersion and 
by shifting them into a different kind of immersion. So it's yeah, I think that also, I mean, this shift that you are describing can also take place in the in the dome itself. So I and I this was also my intention to uh, to to create this kind of shifts where um, basically um, certain elements of the work, like for example this orchestral music which uh, um, which sounds very uh, over the top, uh, in my intention creates uh, some sort of an alienation. Uh, the viewer is uh, basically misled in to feel certain emotions and then by the shift of narration or by the shift of uh, the music and the tools uh, th that I'm using, uh, the viewer m may realize that uh, they that they are being um, uh, basically uh, misled uh, into certain feelings. You know, you are uh, apart from what else you just did, you also answered a question that I haven't even asked, because it would have been a question about the verticality of this medium, and I think that this verticality is also misleading the artist to still you know, be within this uh, paradigm or within this patriarchic verticality of the god and by doing something in the dome and directing our, uh, how do you say, blick of... Hmm? gaze um, upwards, but then yeah, the but sound... Also, I, I think that this verticality, yeah, this verticality is suggested uh, in the piece, but at the same time it's, uh, the piece uh, states that this verticality doesn't really exist because of the, this shifts of uh, narration and because of the presenting um, all these issues in uh, in the territory of just various scales. Mm. Um, it also is created by, I think, um, introducing this, you No, know, usually we are small in a church, but here we are, we are Gaia, basically, especially when we are un under the ocean. So there is a counterpoint that is created from the side of the viewer who is so much in the center of your work. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I, I think that, yeah, that for sure the viewer is the, in the center of my work and uh, just something that I maybe I didn't, uh, I would like to mention uh, as well is that uh, what is interesting about um, experiencing full dome projection in the planetarium, not, uh, for example, in the, uh, in the uh, VR goggles, is that uh, it is a shared exper experience of, uh, of many people, which also makes it very interesting for me, because um, For sure, this uh, this this piece is about uh, pain and loss, and uh, what I and and what I think about uh, these two. The notion of pain is that uh, basically pain is uh, the only the only feeling that is not arbitrary. Uh, so it is also interesting to the the only feeling that is not arbitrary. Uh, that cannot be really questioned, and uh, and it's al it's always an individual uh, a feeling of an individual. So I find it interesting to to set an environment where actually this pain can be a shared feeling. We suffered, and then we have united. So this sufferance and this moment of uh, uniting and this moment of shifting perspectives, it is something that creates this feeling that 
we discover ourselves maybe again or we develop maybe towards something else and and we or we think about something human <laughs> by alienating we actually return to something human and you've mentioned the word ethicality in relation to your aims of making this film can you elaborate a little bit about this ethicality as important aspect well i mean um in, in general, ethicality is, some, is a term that uh, is very present in the discussions about uh, possible ways of tackling the climate change because uh, many of uh, proposed scenarios are, or many of proposed um, ideas how to, how to deal with the climate change are not ethical. Uh, and uh, I think that's... Uh, mm, yeah, in this way, this work is uh, also about ethicality, but but more about uh, the responsibility of of the of the viewer or of the of the human, the sense of uh, the responsibility of an individual. Uh, and uh, but as I said before, because this this work is uh, in, in my intention is supposed to create this. Uh, shift in thinking. Uh, I I feel that um, in this case the the viewer is asked to basically imagine uh, why uh, we are so obsessed about the future and so obsessed about. Uh, the survival, survival of, of uh, our race. Uh, <coughs> like yeah, these are the, uh, the questions that I think are present in the piece. It's also very helpful for losing the feeling of Homo sapiens' importance and fear of our extinction. <coughs> Does anybody have any questions? How is the experience and the questions that are relevant different for adults that are viewing and children? I see a lot of kids. I have no idea how the kids are experiencing this uh, piece. And to be honest, I also uh, have a very vague idea how the adults are experiencing this piece. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, this is not a... This is not a work that I think that can be easily understood by children. And um, because to me this work is like just a very philosophical and poetic essay. I think that uh, I have no idea actually if, uh, if a child would uh, grab the essence of, uh, of uh, all of these shifts that are uh, created in the narration uh, of the piece. Uh, because I think that the child is already uh, formatted to experience these shifts uh, all the time. I think that the child doesn't actually need this, uh, uh, this um, situation of being alienated. I think that the child is already alienated uh, in, a, in a good way. Um, I've got a question about the, the music. Uh, can you just tell what kind of pieces you choose? Or did it was like composed also extra for that piece? Or, or you just choose something? Yeah, so <coughs> the sound was... Um, uh, the sound was created uh, from the um, these orchestral pieces that uh, I actually acquired online from uh, stock um, libraries of music. So, as you can imagine, this uh, music was uh, probably uh, created for big cinematic um, productions. Uh, 
I have chosen delib deliberately uh, very dramatic and, as I said, like over-the-top music. Uh, and um, apart from this, uh, there are some tracks that were spe uh, specially composed uh, for this piece by uh, Igor Kwaczyński, uh, with whom I work. And, uh, and of course, the, the most important is the voice. Uh, the voice uh, is um, Gio Wyatt, the uh, American uh, artist, uh, performer, and uh, musician, um, with whom I uh, basically, uh, during the rehearsals, uh, created the, uh, the soundtrack, the, the melody of the, um, for the songs, and um, it was... Uh, to the much, to to a big extent, uh, uh, it was Gio's interpretation um, of uh, of my text, and um, and I think that it, it sits very well in this piece, uh, especially like the gospel aspects of uh, of his singing, uh, because um, as mentioned before, there is a lot of reflection on, on spirituality in this piece. So I think that uh, th uh, this was uh, this as well as the organ, uh, like church organ um, sounds um, was something that I deliberately uh, used in order to uh, create this background for more spiritual experience with the twist where the viewer uh, also questions the the experience itself because of the shifts in the narration. Uh, I really liked your piece and I'd like to ask how did you test your video? I mean, did you use a head, uh, head view or something like that? Because without the dome, you cannot uh, see the effect of this video. Yeah, this is actually a very difficult part of the process <laughs> uh, that you cannot really test it. Uh, I mean, of course, you can uh, watch the piece on the goggles, but it really doesn't give uh, you an idea how it will look like in the dome, uh, mostly because of the color correction that uh, happens in the process. Uh, I mean, uh, we had... Uh, an, because uh, the whole program is developed together with the Hamburg Planetarium, and uh, this is where the premiere of this piece uh, took place uh, two weeks ago. Uh, we had uh, many tests in the planetarium, so uh, we, were, we were going to Hamburg from time to time to, to see the, the outcome of our work. But uh, that was a very difficult and long process because um, you really cannot foresee how the objects will look uh, on the screen. Because what you see in the screen is kind of distorted, right? It only gets its real shape in the dome. Uh, yeah, it is distorted. It is distorted. But, you know, there are like all of the... Uh, aspects like uh, the scale of the objects that uh, looks very different obviously on the screen and then in the dome like objects tend to look too big in the dome there is the question of light because uh, the contrast in the planetariums is very low so basically uh, it's, it's quite interesting that uh, for example like the most common image that we see in the planetariums, which is the starry sky, is in fact uh, an illusion because there is no blackness in in the uh, in the planetariums. Uh, there is everything is in fact just grey, uh, but because of this very high contrast, uh, the viewer is uh, basically. Uh, uh, is basically made to to understand the, the image as a sky with the like a black pitch black sky with the stars. So this is uh, something that also was very difficult to foresee because of these uh, contrast uh, problems. Uh, um, 
I mean, not problems, it's just a different medium, so you just need to get accustomed to, to this new language. I'd like to ask you about the poetry, because you mentioned the poetry and you keep being referred to as visual artist, but of course poetry is this huge, huge part of your works. And I was wondering about the process behind the poetry creating. Is the poetry parallel to the visual? Is it integrative? Is it complementary? How does it come into life? And what's the relation? Uh, well, I, uh, I don't write poetry uh, on the side uh, from my works. Uh, so my writings are mostly uh, writings for, for that I do for my works, uh, maybe apart from sometimes some essays. Uh, and um, I feel like the, this writing process is uh, the most important part of the work. Uh, usually I... Uh, I gather my thoughts for some time and it looks like I'm not working uh, for a while and, uh, and, and then uh, writing is actually a very uh, like a re uh, relatively short process uh, because uh, I already uh, know how the work should look like. Um, and then, of course, there is an interpretation of the uh, voice actors um, of the writing, which is also very important. Um. Hi. Um, I actually worked on this project as, the, as uh, Agnieszka's animation assistant, and I wanted to ask you, Agnieszka, um, how I was never, it to work with you? It's <laughs> awful. <laughs> but I wanted to ask you um, something that I never uh, actually have understood, which is, who, who is who is this narrator? Like, what is their species, and where do they exist in time? Well, I think that uh, the narrator is. Uh, I mean. The narrator get, gets introduced as a, just like a very uh, scientific sounding narrator that could be just the narrator of an educational piece. And then there are like lots of shifts in, uh, in his personality or, or in their personality. And uh, in the end, it becomes just a cut out face which suggests just nothingness. And to me, this narrator is just representing an uh, internal dialogue that uh, each of us is uh, having in their mind. Uh, this is why it consists of this multitude of different voices and uh, um, it's directed to the viewer, but uh, the viewer becomes somehow the narrator um, in the course of the piece. I don't know if this answers your question. It's, yeah. Me again. Uh, my biggest challenge during the uh, watching was uh, not to close my eyes because the narrator was so meditative and especially on during the flame flame moments, I had a strong tendency to close my eyes and just listen to the narration. But uh, was it intentional or...? <laughs> I mean, I, I didn't want anyone to fall asleep during the piece, but, uh, but, uh, but still, this piece is meant to have elements of a hypnotic session. So I think that it's a, a natural uh, feeling to, to wanting to close your eyes uh, during this uh, piece. I, I thought actually that this piece could uh, function as well as a sound, uh, sound installation. Um, of course it would uh, 
lose um, the aspect of um, destabilizing sense of balance of the viewers, but uh, I think that uh, it could also work this no, way. I mean, the visuals were so good, I didn't close my eyes. And maybe for a few seconds, but... <laughs> well, this is why the narrator tells you uh, Don't close not to, not to yeah, close yeah, your yeah. eyes. <laughs> I actually foresee in this uh, situation. That's what I'm asking, yeah. the feeling of droning, uh, untergehen, um, and had the feeling I'm also the one who is getting extinct, uh, ex uh, extincted. Well, you are. And, <laughs> and uh, my question is, what was your idea, ideas to choose in the second part of the piece to have the position underwater, the underwater position? Uh, well, I, I think that uh, uh, I think that's, uh, I mean, I basically, my idea was to uh, to create this piece that uh, uh, would show the beauty of the, of the Permian um, biosphere. And I wanted to, to present both the marine and the land environments in the piece. This is why there is an underwater scene in the piece. Um, of course, apart from just presenting the beauty of this world, there is this um, darkness that uh, stands behind uh, all of these images. Um, and I think that this, uh, this, this feeling of droning maybe is, uh, could be a reference to uh, what we were talking about uh, with the, uh, the sense, uh, what uh, Berardi is describing as the common sense of uh, suffocating that, that we have uh, at the moment, that we share. Um, yeah. Yes, I love your work. And I'm a psychologist and I worked on uh, altered state of uh, consciousness and I found out that um, all religions use altered state of consciousness um, so whatever you read in a book what you should do for altered states of consciousness religions try to do and I have the feeling that you do it too and um, it's almost like a drug what, what you're doing um, what you're uh, offering to us. And um, yeah, I wanted to ask you if you before, when in your perception of art in your life, and you also had the feeling that other artists, other art you saw before, uh, gave this altered state of mind to you? Well, for sure. I mean, that, uh, there, are, there were lots of pieces that uh, affected me in, in this way. And uh, I think that this is, uh, uh, in my understanding, this is uh, also the, maybe my little goal to create this uh, a quasi-religious environment, uh, which will basically compete with the, with the church. Uh, as a more attractive uh, environment. <laughs> yes, so now everyone stand up and... <laughs> okay. I was gonna ask about um, how long it takes for you, you mentioned how long it takes for you to gather your thoughts and do the writing, um, but in the process, how long does it take from beginning to end for you to create such an immersive piece? Uh, well, um, I was, uh, I mean, I can just give you an example of this piece. Uh, I was commissioned to, I was first invited uh, by the new immersion 
team to to participate uh, in the project uh, two years ago, but uh, uh, I couldn't realize the piece in the first uh, year of, of the new infi infinity. Uh, so I had a bit of time to think about the, the piece. Uh, um, but I think that the actual work uh, on the piece took about eight months. Um, and this is including the writing and um, uh, making a research and, um, and then developing the animation and the sound for the piece. And uh, how did you deal with new information coming out uh, according to the climate situation during the two years that you were invited? Well, I, I, I don't think that so much has changed in the this two years. Uh, so I think that uh, I was not surprised by some news. Um, it's great that um, you chose the Earth as a protagonist of this piece in the place which is called Planetarium. Thank you. It was a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.